All right, students, it's time for another marine ecology lecture. This one is about biodiversity and food webs, two related concepts that fall in the category of community ecology because uh, community, of course, is a group of m multiple species interacting uh, together, mul populations of multiple species. Um, so uh, a food web is sort of a conceptual model, uh, which can be a visual diagram like the one here, or a mathematical model that uh, uses equations to describe the connections between different species. So in this model, each uh, bubble or square or triangle represents a particular species in this community of multiple species. And these links, or sorry, these uh, uh, different species in the food web are referred to as nodes. Uh, node is sort of like the area where multiple paths connect in a diagram or mathematical model. So um, these nodes represent different species. And then these lines between the nodes represent consumptive links between species, so something eating something else. Uh, and in this diagram that I've drawn here, it's uh, sort of spatially organized with the higher trophic levels or the predators uh, at the top and the uh, herbivores in the center and herbivores and at the bottom would be the plants. So you can see that there's more than one kind of plant, more than one kind of herbivore, and more than one kind of predator. And there's some kind of complicated paths between them because not all the predators eat all the different types of herbivores. Not all the herbivores eat all the different types of plants. There's some variety and interconnections in this food web. So food webs can be pretty complicated, but you already know something about a simple kind of food web. So we'll show that on the next slide. So this is the simplest kind of food web. It's called a food chain. And a food chain is a very simplified food web in which there's just one species or one category at each trophic level. And therefore, we say that trophic levels are discrete. Discrete means um, just one thing rather than like a multitude of things. So discrete means a single thing is at each trophic level. So this is the simplest possible food web model. And one thing about this simplified model of the food web, the food chain model, is that it predicts trophic cascades. That's a concept that we've already talked about, but a trophic cascade is where an increase or where a change at uh, the top level ripples down and affects lower levels. So for example, if there's an increase in populations of predators, that will decrease populations of herbivores, and that will in turn increase populations of plants. So the change that uh, initially happened at the top level, for some reason there was an increase in the abundance of predators, ripples down and affects the bottom level. And it affects things in an alternating way. So if the level above increases, the level below that decreases, and the level below that increases and if there were levels still further down it would be alternating uh, as you went down and that's a trophic cascade and you can see it's pretty easy to figure out what will happen in a trophic cascade using a food chain model so that's the idea of food web models in general is they allow you to predict what will happen in the entire community based on what happens at one level you just sort of trace um, the effects from one node to the other based on the sign of the interaction. Like if it's a, if something increases the plants because this is a positive interaction, it will increase the herbivores. And if the herbivores increase, that will increase the predators. So going up the chain, everything is kind of like a positive interaction. Uh, but going down the chain, since, um, you know, it's it's like a negative interaction, and this is a negative interaction also, but then the indirect interaction would actually be positive because in this case, uh, two negatives make a positive because you're decreasing one of the negative pathways. Anyways, so simple model, 
but it generates some interesting uh, predictions as far as trophic cascades go. Alright, so one of the famous early papers that made far-reaching predictions based on the trophic cascade model was the uh, so-called uh, HSS paper. This paper is so cited by ecologists that they just call it HSS, which is the author's first initials, Hairston, Smith and Slobodkin. So in 1960 these guys published their paper and they came up with a trophic cascade model that explained the abundance of leafy trees and vegetation on the landscapes of the earth as the result of a approximately three level food chain. So in their food chain they've got leafy producers which is like trees um, and folio, foliovorous herbivores, which means leaf-eating herbivores. So that's like um, caterpillars. I'm trying to draw a caterpillar here. I'm not an entomologist, but that's, that's my best. So this caterpillar is eating a leaf. So this is supposed to be like a half-eaten leaf. All right, so um, foliovor folivorous herbivores uh, and then the carnivores would be like uh, birds that eat the bugs that eat the trees so here's a bird and it's ready to eat bugs so um, yeah the idea is that the primary producers are limited by competition. So basically they're competing with each other for what things do primary producers need. They need light, water, nutrients. Um, so let's see, put the below ground part of this tree in there so you can remember that it's competing for below ground resources like water and nutrients as well. Um, and then the, if, there were no, if there was not a third trophic level, the populations of the trees might be limited by the fact that they've got these uh, voracious insects eating at them all the time. And so uh, instead of having a nice forest full of trees, you'd have these little uh, uh, stubs that were eaten to death by uh, the foliovorous herbivores. Um, but you don't see that. Uh, if you look at forests around the world and stuff, they're full of leafy green trees, not devastated stumps for the most part, unless there's just been a plague of locusts or something. And then, so, Hairston Smith and Slobodkin said they thought that was because um, these birds are eating the bugs uh, and effectively suppressing the populations of bugs for the most part so that you rarely see the bugs overeating and limiting the amount of the leafy producers. So the implication of this world is green hypothesis is that the higher level consumers, the predators, have a very, very important role in maintaining the forest. So after this theory was published, there were a lot of criticisms and reinterpretations of it. And uh, this there may have been some other things going on that explained the world being green that that weren't uh, it, and it wasn't just this uh, top-down interaction we think for example that plant defenses the fact that plants are kind of difficult to, to eat and, and poor quality nutrition might also limit the abundance of folivorous herbivores uh, but uh, there was uh, uh, something to the world is green hypothesis and it, it's still an influential hypothesis today and in marine ecology as well, we find a lot of situations where ecosystems are maintained by indirect effects that ripple down from the third or higher trophic level all the way down to the primary producers. And it all started with Hairston Smith and Slobodkin. All right, so um, th those were some of the cool predictions that you can make just on a food chain. Of course, the, the real world is much more complicated than a food chain. You do not really have discrete trophic levels in most food chain or most food webs. You have multiple species at each trophic level.
So since you have multiple species and they can differ in their food preferences, what they eat, and also they differ in, in terms of what eats them, the, you have a variety of connections among the species and a variety of indirect interactions are possible. So you can have trophic cascades. Um, that is a possibility even in a diverse food web like this. Uh, but you can also have other kinds of weird I indirect interactions. Like for example, this predator here that I'm circling, it eats this herbivore, but it's actually um, not a strict predator because it also eats this plant. So it is what we would call an omnivore, like something like a bear or a raccoon that eats plants and animals. And in fact, that's quite common in nature, uh, which is why we say trophic levels are not always discrete, meaning that a predator is not always purely a predator. It could be sort of a mix between a uh, herbivore and a predator, like this one that I've highlighted here. And that means that some of your predictions about trophic cascades are a little bit harder to make because, um, you know, if there's an increase in the abundance of this predator, is that going to decrease this prey because it uh, eats this prey? Or is it going to increase this prey because it eats something that might be eating that prey? So is, is this direct negative more strong than the effect of the uh, double negative effect here that would actually be a positive effect or not? So, so it gets really hard to make these predictions about exactly what will happen when you change one thing in one of these webs when the web gets big like this. All right, so one of the problems with a web where things are just connected by little sticks is you don't know how strong the interactions are between one species and the next. So what you need to do then is have some way that you can characterize how significant the interactions are between each pair of species that's that's known to interact by one eating the other. And so that's where these other more complicated kinds of food webs come into play, which they consider the strength of the interactions. So the interaction web considers the strength of the interactions. Um, so it, it's quantitative. It, it doesn't just show what's connected to what. It actually shows like well, this predator eats a lot of this prey, so this is a really strong connection here, very influential. Uh, an interaction web is also not limited to purely trophic interactions, so it could also include things that are ways that p things interact other than eating each other, like competing with each other or helping each other through some kind of uh, s facilitative relationship where they're sort of cooperating or, or uh, in inadvertently helping each other. Uh, so these interaction webs are obviously much more realistic uh, because they capture the nuances of how things are really uh, interacting in nature, but it's hard to measure and it's hard to know exactly how significant the interactions are between different species in the community. And to get this kind of information, you would need to do experiments where you'd sort of set up a model community and increase or decrease the abundance of one species at a time and measure how strongly uh, the other species in the web were affected. And that's very difficult to do in, in practice. So in part because getting specific quantitative information on food webs is so difficult to do in the real world, scientists are often looking for ways to kind of uh, simplify or come up with general rules of thumb for how complicated ecological communities work. And biodiversity, understanding biodiversity itself, can help us understand some of the ways that the, these complex communities we have in the world uh, work. So we often study biodiversity itself. And to study biodiversity itself, we need to, some ways to measure biodiversity. And th those are what we call biodiversity metrics. So we may not have like a perfect detailed quantitative food web, but if we at least know what the level of biodiversity is in a particular community, 
we can maybe still understand some of the ways that that ecological community is working. Okay, so what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is the variety of life. So typically when we talk about biodiversity, we're focused on species as the, as the basic unit of biodiversity. So we're sort of tallying up the number of different species. Like if you've got an ecological community that has 10 species, you would consider that to be more diverse than an ecological community that only has five species. Um, but we don't always just focus on species. Sometimes we might look at finer units like genetic diversity within a species. Uh, some of my colleagues have looked at genetic diversity within one species of seagrass, for example, and have found that meadows made of more genetically diverse uh, populations of seagrass can be more productive and more resistant to disturbance than seagrass meadows made up of just one clone of genetically identical seagrass. So genetic diversity can make a difference even if you just have a small number of species. Uh, conversely, we can look at broader uh, units of diversity than species. So we can look at higher taxonomic levels like how many different families are there or how many different phyla are there. Uh, and sometimes that can help us explain the properties of communities as well. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you that biodiversity is something worth measuring. And now how exactly do we measure biodiversity? There's multiple ways. So the simplest measure of biodiversity is what we call species richness. This does not refer to how much money the species have. It's not that kind of richness. It is simply a count of the number of different species. So if you have uh, a fish and a crab in your community, the diversity of that community, or sorry, the species richness of that community would be two because you've got two different speci species. Even if you had more than one individual of this fish, more than one individual of the crab, takes me a long time to draw the crab, um, get the idea. Uh, the, diverse, the richness would still be two because it's not affected by how many individuals there are. It's just affected by the number of unique species and the number of unique species is still two even if there's a lot of individuals uh, within, within those species. All right, um, so that's the simple way of measuring biodiversity, but sometimes we do want to know about how many individuals there are within each species. And so we have other measures of biodiversity that do take account of the abundance of individuals. So one of those measures is the Shannon Diversity Index, abbreviated H prime, H with an apostrophe behind it is pronounced H prime. And that is the sum of the proportional abundance uh, of each species times the natural logarithm of the proportional abundance of that species multiplied by negative one. So that's a, a little bit complicated, uh, but in your lecture notes, there is an example of how you could calculate that for a community in a spreadsheet. So uh, it sort of goes through the steps and shows you uh, how you calculate the proportional abundance of each species in the community, and then how you sum all those proportional abundances times the natural logarithm of the proportional abundances of all the species together to get the H prime. So the Shannon diversity is a value between one and like about four. So if you have a, a community that's with a Shannon index of zero, that's really low diversity. Um, and if you had a Shannon diversity of close to four, that would be really high diversity, meaning that there were a lot of species and there was also sort of like a fair distribution of abundance within the species. So the Shannon diversity in index is affected not only by the species richness, but by how evenly, even the amounts of each species are. Uh, and so there's another species there's another biodiversity index based on the Shannon index that focuses only on how evenly distributed the species are. So the PLU evenness is like um, the part of the Shannon diversity index 
uh, the, it's like the Shannon Diversity Index if you ignored the uh, of species richness and only focused on how equitably distributed the abundance of individuals was among species. So if you want to calculate the PLU evenness J prime, you first have to calculate the Shannon Index, which is here. And then you have to calculate the, m the highest that the Shannon Index could possibly be if the species in that community were perfectly evenly distributed. So H prime max is kind of like an imaginary Shannon Index um, where you, ha you use the same species richness that you had for your actual community and the same total abundance of individuals that you had for your ac actual community but you um, evenly split the individuals between all the different species. So if you can imagine that there's like three categories of species in your community, and I'm making these categories as like bins. So there's species A, B, and C. And so in your community, let's say there's like a whole lot of species A, uh, there's medium amount of species B and there's not very much of species C. Um, so that's your actual community and you run the numbers on it and you you figure out the the H prime. So then you got to figure out what could the H prime possibly be if the uh, community was perfectly even. So then you take the same three bins so A, B, and C, so you, you're still basing it on something that a community that just has three species. Um, but now you're taking the total number of individuals that you have in your community and you're evenly piling them into each of um, the three categories. So whatever the total number, the sum of A, B, and C was, um, you total that up and divide it by three and put that equal number in e to each species category and you calculate a Shannon index based on this perfectly even community and uh, that's what your H prime max is based on. So uh, the J prime, uh, if your real community was perfectly even, the J prime could be equal to one and if your real community was anything less than perfectly even, your J prime would be something less than one. So J prime is a number uh, between zero and one uh, at the maximum. All right, so there's a problem that you can do on the next page. And if you don't advance the s slide or, or if, you, if you pause it before the answer appears, you can sort of test yourself and see if you can calculate this yourself. And I would recommend you do that. Okay, so here are your two example communities, one on the left one on the right and I would like you to calculate for each of these communities the uh, species diversity, the Shannon index, and the PLU's evenness index. So with the formulas on the previous slide you should be able to do that. Um, so I'll, this would be a good spot to pause it because I'm about to give you the answers. All right, so here's, uh, here's the answers for this community. The species richness is four because there's four unique species here. There's kitty cats, beluga whales, bulldogs, and butterflies. Um, and the Shannon index, if you went through all the math and calculated it, is 0 0.75, so not particularly diverse. Uh, and the evenness is uh, 0.54, so not particularly evenly distributed either. For the next community, the species richness is lower. So it's got the same uh, bulldogs, kitty cats, and belugas, but it doesn't have the butterflies. So there's one less species. Uh, species richness, therefore, is three. Uh, Shannon index is higher, though. So um, according to the Shannon index of diversity, this community is more diverse. Why is that? It's because it's more evenly, uh, equitably distributed. So instead of being kitty cat dominated like this community where there's a preponderance of kitty cats this one has sort of a, a more fair mix of abundance uh, among the possible species in fact uh, it's got exactly five uh, well does it have exactly no um, I guess 
it, it's pretty evenly distributed. It's got five kitty cats and five bulldogs and four belugas, so that's pretty pretty even. All right, so uh, we talked about how you could calculate diversity for a given community, and we did that with those two examples with the cartoon animals. Um, so biodiversity is uh, another complexity to measuring biodiversity is that s nature comes in different scales from like uh, an individual habitat patch to a broader area to the entire planet. And so when we're measuring biodiversity, we have to think about what scale, uh, spatial scale, we're measuring biodiversity at and what particular aspect of biodiversity is really important for us to, n to know. So uh, this scientist, uh, Whitaker, in 1972, came up with this scale of alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. So alpha diversity was diversity within a s defined spatial area. So like the two examples that we just gave where I gave you a particular area, I showed you what species were in it, and we calculated the diversity. Uh, that's what we just did. So diversity within a defined spatial area. And alpha diversity is the most common type of diversity that ecologists will measure. Beta diversity is a little bit different. It's the differences in species assemblages among areas. So uh, in the previous example, there was only one species that was like not in common between the two communities. It was the butterfly. Uh, the butterfly that was in one of the communities but not the other. So um, the difference in the species assemblage, uh, the, the beta diversity would have been one because there was just that one species that was different between the two communities. Uh, and then the gamma diversity is the total diversity in the broader geographic region. So one individual patch of habitat might have five species, another habitat might have seven species, but maybe some of the, sp maybe several of the species are different. So um, if you just look through the whole region, what species could possibly be in the region, that is the gamma diversity. So I'm going to give you an example of that coming up. All right, so here's our example of alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. And the we're going to use the simplest measurement of diversity in this example. So we're going to use species richness as our measurement of diversity. So um, uh, we've got two areas, area one and area two. And we've got a list of species found in the region. So uh, those are those species. And in the first area, three of those species are present. In the second area, one, two, three, four, five, six, six of those species are present. So um, the alpha diversity of area one is three, and the alpha diversity of area two is six. All right, so next is we have to figure out beta diversity. So beta diversity is the number of species that are not in common between the two areas. So um, he, area one has one species that's not found in area two, and area two has four species that are not found in area one. So the total number of species that are not shared between the two species is five, and that's why our beta diversity is five. Um, and then our gamma diversity, that's the total biodiversity of the region. And so the region includes both area one and area two, and therefore the gamma diversity is seven because there's a total of seven species. Okay, so uh, we talked about species richness. We talked about species diversity that takes into account the distribution of abundance among individuals uh, and the evenness. And we talked about how we can measure biodiversity at different spatial scales, alpha, beta, and gamma to biodiversity. But we're forgetting something very, very important about biodiversity. And that is species identity. Another word for species identity is species composition. So species identity or species composition. So what particular species are there matters. Like you could have 10 species, but if they're all crabs, that's very different than if you have 10 species and they're all birds. 
Okay, so, so here's what I mean by that. Part species composition. What particular species are there? So these two communities have exactly the same uh, metrics of species diversity as far as the species richness is two for both of these and um, the biodiv other biodiversity indices like the evenness and the Shannon's index would also be the same. But obviously these communities are not the same because it's different um, species in each community. Uh, and so that's why species composition obviously matters a lot. So there are some uh, metrics of biodiversity that take it, that species composition into account. Um, and I'll explain what some of those are now. So I'm going to explain, I'm going to just kind of list each one of these here and I'll explain a little bit more about them on subsequent slides. So if you don't get the entire story from this slide, you'll get it on the next ones. So um, one way that species composition comes into play is when we calculate functional diversity. So functional diversity means like the variety of different functions that are being performed by the species in the community. So um, if you've got five species, but they're all doing pretty much the same thing, that would be low functional diversity. But if you've got five species, but each one is doing something very different, then you would have relatively high functional diversity. So uh, it's not just how many species there are, but it's how many different things or or how many different roles those species are doing, performing, that, that matters in functional diversity. Um, similar to functional diversity, well, actually, it's kind of like the flip side of the yin-yang for, for functional diversity. So um, the yin-yang is this symbol here where you've got um, uh, sort of like uh, this symbol, and you've got there's a little bit of black in the white and a little bit of white in the black. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, anyways, um, functional diversity um, is the number of different ecological roles that are represented by species in the community, and that's important. But functional redundancy is also important because it's the number of redundant species in the community, the number of species able to perform the same ecological role. So why would why would you want to have multiple species that are doing the same thing in the community? Well, it's kind of like insurance in case you lose one of those species. Um, if you uh, lose some species or they become rare due to disease or predation or something, but there's some other species that still left in the community that are performing the same function, then the function gets done even though some of the species were um, not doing so well. So functional redundancy is important just as functional diversity is important. So functional diversity helps make sure that lots of different roles can get done. Functional redundancy means that they're sort of like backup players to perform each of those functional roles. So ideally you want diversity and redundancy. Um, but of course you need a lot of species to get the diversity and the redundancy. All right, uh, next thing is multivariate measures of similarity slash difference among communities. So this is the idea that we can compare two ecological communities, like in the previous example, that area one and area two, in terms of uh, how, how ab what species they have and how abundant each of those species are. So uh, multivariate statistics help us do that. It's kind of like a fancy way of doing the beta diversity idea. Uh, and the final thing that we do with species composition information is we come up with biotic indices of habitat health or quality. That's why we sort of, we, we kind of take inventory of what particular species are present in a community and we use that to decide whether that community is healthy or good quality or if it's impaired in bad quality. All right, so this that slide is supposed to, sh to show you about functional diversity. So we've got three species of macroalgae here. We've got a red one, a green one, and a brown one. And so that's like pretty decent uh, diversity at the primary producer level. Uh, but it looks like we've only got one species of consumer here. And this one species of consumer is only eating one of the types of algae. Uh, this, by the way, is an amphipod. Amphipod. It's a type of uh, crustacean uh, that is a amphipod. Oops, pod. Um, 
amphipods are uh, sort of like the insects of the ocean, although they're not insects, they're crustaceans. Um, yeah, and so this thing only eats green algae, so at the level of consumers, there's low functional diversity because well, there's low diversity overall, there's just one species, and also there's low functional diversity because it only eats one thing. Uh, one of the consequences of this low functional diversity might be that uh, the abundance of red and brown algae would explode because there was nothing in the community to eat them. So low functional diversity could be bad if you were worried about there being too much growth of algae. All right, so let's add some more functional diversity. If we add this snail, um, this snail actually only eats brown algae, but uh, now that we've got two species here, we've got more functional diversity because this one's performing a function that, uh, sorry, this one is performing a function that this one is not performing. And if we add yet more species, um, we find that we're now, we've now increased the functional diversity so all of these species of algae are getting eaten um, this one species here, this is a uh, voracious isopod, seems to actually be eating all the different three different types of algae, and it's even demonstrated some intergild predation. It looks like it's eating some amphipods, uh, which can happen. Um, so we really increase the functional diversity now, and now that we've got this uh, diverse community of music grazers, it looks like they're going to be effectively clearing out all the algae because the functional diversity is high enough that they can eat all the different types of algae. Okay, so multivariate measures of community composition. Uh, it's kind of an intimidating concept because it's got the word multivariate in it, and usually one variable is enough to freak most people out if you're doing math or statistics, and so like multiple variables is really confusing. But um, if you think about why we would might ever want to do multivariate statistics, then we can approach this from a, a more intuitive standpoint. So think about the question, a, a common question that people might want to ask about two communities. They would, they would often want to a answer the question, how similar or different are the communities of species in my samples from different times or places? Uh, for example, I study animals that live in seagrass beds and I am often interested in like are there different animals in the seagrass bed at different times of year or in different places like in different estuaries or maybe depending on the salinity levels there's different communities of life and it would be tough to do that um, species by species but I was oftentimes I would just want to answer a more general question like are these communities different um, so if we can sort of compare all the species at once that would make it easier uh, but but I'll show you just the sort of the univariate way of comparing communities first all right so in, in my example here I've got uh, two kinds of places we've got reef and we've got lagoon so lagoons are sort of like the sheltered shallow waters behind reefs where they often have seagrass and, and seaweed and sand sand beds uh, and these are species that might be found in the Caribbean or, or Gulf of Mexico these are uh, species of fish so um, uh, and we've got a different row because we've got a um, different uh, maybe we've got multiple samples from the reef and multiple samples from the lagoon we took four samples from each to do a better statistical characterization so we um, have taken the average abundance of each fish from each habitat, and that's what we have in these uh, final rows here. So we've got uh, an average from the reef, an average from the lagoon for each of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven species of fish. So seven species is a lot of species, and it's, it's tough to like look at all these numbers and come up with like an overall idea of how the reef and the lagoon differ in terms of their fish communities um, but we really want to know like overall what's the difference between the reef communities of fish and the lagoon communities of fish um, putting these together as a graph can help a little bit so here's a graph um, with those uh, same seven species of uh, fish and you can see that there's some that are more abundant in the lagoon and some that are more abundant in the reef. 
So it does seem, well, and this one's pretty much equally abundant in the reef and the lagoon. Acanthostrachy on quadricornis is the scrawled cowfish, and it's kind of like uh, some w one that you would find in the reef and in the lagoon. It's kind of like equally abundant in both habitats. So I try to, you know, be realistic when I, these are the scrawl, scrawled marks on the scrawled cowfish. Um, I tried to be uh, sort of realistic in where the species that I listed would possibly be found. All right. Um, okay. So uh, scrawled cowfish is an uh, equal opportunity. It might be found in the lagoon. Um, lagoon. Or on the reef. But for the other ones, it seems like there's a definite trend where there's certain s fish that are more abundant on the reef and certain fish that are more abundant on the lagoon. Um, and if if you have just seven species, then like it's not that hard to compare. But imagine if you had like uh, 50 different species I, I, and you had maybe not just two different sites, but seven different sites. It could get really, really difficult to compare the communities. And that's where the multivariate statistics come in. So. The multivariate statistics are a way of looking at um, a whole bunch of uh, species at, at once and characterizing the overall site uh, relative to other sites. So a really common type of software that's used for multivariate statistics is called Primer. Um, it's a private company that I think it, it's based in Plymouth, England, and that's what the P in Primer is for. Plymouth routines in multivariate ecological research, something something like that. I'm not sure exactly what it, it stands for, but it's a software package uh, that the university has and that a, a lot of scientists use um, that considers the abundance of all the species in each of the samples that you're comparing, uh, and then it sort of plots how similar the different samples are. So ecologists are often sampling communities in different ways. Uh, and in the two example graphs here, one and two, there are two different ways of graphing the same community information. So thi these two graphs are based on a study where they took sediment grab samples from the sea bottom. So they lowered a grab sampler from the edge of a boat. It clomped up a big chunk of mud. They brought it to the surface. Some scientists picked through it in the lab and separated and counted all of the different and identified to species all the different species that were found in it. Uh, and then they entered those data into a big spreadsheet table. And then they put the spreadsheet table into the computer and ran the primer software on it and the primer classified all those different communities based on how similar or different they were from each other. Um, so one of the factors that they kept track of when they were uh, sampling these communities was the depth. So um, that is shown as these different color and symbol codes on the diagram. And so what you can see is that samples that came from within a certain depth range tended to be most similar to other samples that were taken within that depth range. And so you can see that the shallow samples from 0 to 25 meters depth, their communities were um, similar on this axis. So there was not very much difference from sample to sample within the 0 to 25 meters depth. But there was some difference um, between the shallow depths and the deeper depths. And the, the bigger the branches are here, that means like the um, more extreme the differences were between those samples. So if you're comparing samples from very shallow in the ocean to the very deep sea, there's like a really big difference between the communities that are found at those sites. It probably means that none of the species are in common. Um, so this branching diagram called a cluster diagram is one way that you can sort of represent how different the um, communities are from in all the different samples from the different depth zones. And another type of diagram that you can do is called an MDS plot. And basically, it puts the things on a two-dimensional axis. And basically, the closer the two points are together, the more similar they are to each other. So um, 
things that are far apart are very different. And so you can see that um, within the, let's see, what depth range? The 0 to 100 meter depth range, um, everything is uh, about 60% similar. And looks like within the um, 100 to 500 meter depth range, things are also 60% similar. And things are almost similar to other things within their depth range. So it's, it's really cool for helping sort of categorize different communities by how similar they are. And um, there's just a lot of really interesting things that you can do with this kind of multivariate comparison of how similar different communities of organisms are. All right, so the final way that we use multi, uh, sorry, the final way that we use species composition in our estimates and assessments of biodiversity is by using species composition to calculate indices of biological integrity. Indices of biological integrity are often abbreviated IBI. So they're based on the relative abundance of what we call indicator species. And indicator species are either species that indicate healthy environments, like these um, burrowing amphipods, which need well oxygenated, healthy sediments to live, or impaired environmental conditions, like these uh, oligochaetes, which are found in uh, organically enriched anoxic or, or low oxygen sediments. So if you're finding a lot of oligochaetes in your samples, that would mean that your index of bio Biological, biological integrity would be lower. Like every time you find an oligochaete in your sample, you have to add negative one. And every time you find a burrowing amphipod in your sample, you add positive one. So basically the, the species that are associated with a healthy habitat increase your score, and the species that are associated with an unhealthy habitat decrease your score. And when you add it all up together, you get uh, a benthic index of biotic integrity that you can use com to compare different sites as far as like how healthy or polluted they are. Um, one of the catches to this, these indices of biological integrity is that you have to develop them individually for every specific area that you study. You can't use one index of biological integrity all over the world because each sort of region of the world has its own set of species that you'd find in a good habitat versus a bad habitat within that region. So Chesapeake Bay ha oftentimes uses indices of biological integrity to assess its health uh, and it has a benthic index of biological integrity um, which is um, used to see sort of like how healthy the sea bottom life is and it's not very healthy in this situation but it's very healthy in this situation and it's also got a phytoplankton index of biotic integrity so in this situation it's not very healthy uh, but in this situation it is healthier um, there's different types of phytoplankton and different uh, abundances of phytoplankton so um, those are indices of biotic integrity okay so um, because ecological communities and biodiversity are such a complex topic, ecologists have a lot of confusing terms related to biodiversity and food webs. And I just wanted to review some of the other terms that you might see if you're reading papers on this topic. So one is species assemblage. Um, species assemblage just means what particular species are in that community. So um, species assemblage is, is roughly synonymous with community composition. So composition. Uh, and a, sp a particular species assemblage is a community with a particular species composition. Um, what species uh, are, are put together there. Um, community structure is another one that you'll see and that means about the same thing as food web structure. It basically means um, what species are there, uh, what's the diversity, and how are the species linked to each other, like which ones are, are eating what. So it basically just means what's the food web like in this community? How, how many, what species are there and how are they linked together? So it's a little bit different from just species assemblage because uh, community structure or food web structure is not just what species are there, but also how are they linked.
And then there's community dynamics, which is a little more complicated as well because it's not just what species are there and how are they linked, but how do those links af affect the populations of each species over time. So community dynamics would be things like how the prey abundance changes as the predators become more abundant, and how do changes in primary productivity ripple through the food web. Trophic cascades, for example, would be part of community dynamics. So dynamics means like changes over time, uh, kind of like action in the uh, food web. So changes over time uh, in the populations that make up the community. Uh, and then uh, the f final one here doesn't really match with the other one, so I'll cut it off. Um, so biotope, it means a specific community type characterized by a particular set of species. So um, if there's like a, a particular set of species that you would find in a Southwest Florida oyster reef, for example, then you could call it the Southwest Florida oyster reef biotope. Um, and you would sort of know you were looking at that biotope if you were finding this particular set of species. Okay, so moving on, there are some important questions that scientists have been asking about biodiversity for a long period of time, and some of them have been mostly answered, some of them we're still working on. So these are sort of my top four questions of important uh, top three, top four list of important questions that people ask about biodiversity. One is how many species are there, like on the planet? Um, two is why are there so many species instead of just one or two? How and why does biodiversity vary from place to place or within taxonomic and, and functional groups? So why do some places have more species than other places? And then what are the consequences of changes in biodiversity? That's one that's particularly interesting to me. What happens when biodiversity changes due to human effects, for example? So we'll start with the first one. How many species exist on Earth? Well, we don't have a full count. So because not all of the species on Earth have been officially cataloged. Like we know that there are actually more species on Earth that don't have official names than there are species that are in the books already. So um, I'm getting these data from a 2011 paper that sort of tallied up all the species that have already been found and described in a book somewhere and use a variety of methods to kind of extrapolate how many species were still out there that we haven't found yet. One of the ways that they extrapolate how many we might not have found yet is by looking at studies that sampled in an unexplored area for the first time and looking at what percentage of the species they found were new to science. And that you can use as an extrapolation like, okay, when we looked at this area that we hadn't explored, 90% uh, of the species were new to science and we know that this much area has not yet been explored and so using this sort of complicated math you can kind of estimate how many species are still out there to be found and we, it's certainly not a perfect estimate but it's probably a, a pretty it, it's the best estimate that we have so uh, the estimates are that about uh, nine million species exist on earth uh, of those we've only officially cataloged about two million um, so in the ocean, we estimate that there are about 2,200,000 marine species. And we have definitely not categorized uh, very many of those. Only 9% of those have been officially described, which is less than the percentage of land species that have been officially described because the ocean is a difficult environment to explore. It's underwater. So uh, in the ocean, 91% of marine species are still undescribed. So that's, it's a good time. Well, it's always a good time to be a marine biologist, but this is something to think of, think about um, if you're s getting the feeling that like, oh, we already know everything about the world. We definitely don't. 91% um, of species still undescribed. So go out there and describe them. Okay, so the next question is, why are there so many species? Well, to answer this question of why there are, are almost 9 million species on Earth today, we have to think about where the species on Earth 
come from and uh, where they go because species don't last forever. All right, so um, species uh, originate via the process of speciation. So there was, there was one ancestral life form that originated via abiogenesis uh, from non-living chemicals that happened to uh, assemble somehow in a, in a way that was able to replicate itself. Uh, and that first species uh, then branched out. And so anytime there's a branch in the tree of life, speciation has occurred. So um, here the speciation has occurred and you've gone from one to two species. Here there's another branch and you've gone to three species. Um, if there's another branch in the tree, we go to four species and, and so on. You know, five species, six species. Um, so, uh, so that sort of explains the increase in, in total species on Earth as, as we go through time. If you're looking at like one particular spot, like a, an island, there's an island, um, it starts with zero species. But if a species lands on the island then and colonizes it, then you've got one species there. So colonization um, can affect diversity and a, a, a particular spot. Um, although that species had to already exist somewhere else in order to um, get to that spot. So uh, the colonization doesn't mean that total Earth biodiversity is increasing. It just means that the diversity of this particular spot is increasing. Um, and then there's uh, extinction. So not species don't last forever. So um, you know, one particular species m might uh, survive and continue into the future, uh, but some other species, not so much. So here it looks like on this uh, tree, uh, four species went extinct and two survived. So we went from having five species at this point in time to having two species at this point in time. And so if you look at the history of the numbers of species that have been on Earth, we've had some ups and downs. And that's, whoops, um, and, and there's various diagrams that'll show that. When, when there's a mass extinction, um, which are actually kind of indicated in this diagram here as these uh, uh, points where the tree of life sort of gets cropped, um, uh, well, this one was not a mass extinction. This was actually a big diversification event. But there were other points where the, the tree of life sort of narrowed down. Um, so, yeah, anyway, so th this process of speciation uh, over time has generally exceeded the rate of extinction. So there have been the, these periods that we call mass extinctions where the rate of extinction was faster than the rate of new species arising. And so we lost species at those times. But overall, we've been adding species at a faster rate than species have been disappearing. So that's why we have a lot of species now. Uh, and also, we started a very long time ago, uh, almost 4 billion years ago. Uh, OK, so this is the diagram that I was thinking about. Um, this shows the uh, diversity of um, sort of the, f the number of families is how we're measuring diversity. In this case, we're using a higher taxonomic indicator of diversity. Um, of of uh, animal life that appear in the uh, fossil record. So you can see in the Precambrian period there were very few families of animal life and then we started to have a lot of families of animal life. But there were certain times in history where there were big mass extinction events and we lost a lot of families. And the biggest one that Earth ever had was the end Permian extinction. Um, and the, by comparison, the extinction that killed the dinosaurs or killed the non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period was, was not even that bad compared to this one that happened at the end Permian. Um, and we think that we're in another mass extinction event now due to humans and our uh, ways of modifying Earth's environment. Okay. All right, so uh, next question about biodiversity. How does biodiversity vary? Like, um, why are, where are there a lot of species? Where are there not so many species? 
and so we have looked at all kind of different patterns in biodiversity where the species hotspots are etc and so one of the main pattern uh, explainers that we've looked at is latitude or climate so there tend to be some strong latitudinal patterns in diversity for most groups most types of uh, organism there's greater species diversity near the equator than near the pole but there are some exceptions to that um, by geographic region so even um, within a latitudinal band like even within tropical waters there's differences from place to place like the indo-pacific has uh, more species than the Caribbean um, and that's related to some uh, ancient biogeographic factors that are different between the two areas. Uh, along gradients within regions there are differences in biodiversity so uh, you could be within a region but uh, the species diversity might vary with depth or salinity uh, or other types of gradient within the region and among habitat types so that would be like you know between a sand flat and a seagrass bed you might find some differences in the diversity of associated species so here's lots of different types of species that are living in the seagrass bed whereas there's just not very much uh, diversity outside of the seagrass bed so among habitat types um, and one thing to keep in mind is that the patterns vary on if you're talking about total biodiversity or biodiversity within a particular taxonomic group. So like if you're looking at total number of marine species, there's definitely more total marine species towards the tropics. But if you're looking at species of marine mammals, there's actually more species of marine mammals in the polar regions. All right. Uh, so fish species diversity illustrates these latitudinal and regional differences pretty well so this is uh, the x-axis here is latitude so this is the equator at zero degrees latitude and this is the uh, Antarctic here at uh, really low southerly latitudes and this is the Ar Arctic at uh, high latitudes and so there's more species regardless of whether oh yeah um, so so the the black line is the Pacific Ocean boy I can't write today and the uh, dotted line is the Atlantic Ocean and so although the overall trend is the same uh, Atlantic Ocean fish diversity peaks at low latitudes and Pacific Ocean sp species diversity peaks at low latitudes um, the uh, there's a difference between the two oceans so the Pacific Ocean has a much higher maximum diversity of fish than the Atlantic Ocean does even though both of them have the same kind of uh, north to south um, equator to poles difference so there's both a latitudinal pattern and which is the equator having more species and a regional difference which is the Pacific having more species. Um, you can see the same kind of latitudinal and regional differences if you look at terrestrial vertebrate diversity on this color-coded diagram here you can see that the Amazon and the rainforests of Africa and Southeast Asia have really high vertebrate species diversity um, relative to other parts of the world although there are some other interesting hot spots like uh, at the north end of India where you're at the foothills of the Himalayas there's really high diversity there so interesting global patterns of diversity um, you can see why people are worried about the destruction of the Amazon rainforest because so much of our diversity at least in terms of terrestrial vertebrates is there uh, okay so why do some places have so much higher diversity than other places like why does the equator have more why does the Pacific Ocean have more than the Atlantic Ocean uh, these are important biogeographical questions so uh, the answers are complicated but they involve numerous ecological forces and historical circumstances so it's not just uh, what the environment is like today although that does matter but it's also these historical circumstances that have 
led to more speciation relative to extinction. Um, so remember, speciation and colonization are things that can increase species diversity, and extinction is one that can decrease it. So um, you know, some places have had more speciation and colonization. Other places have had more extinction in the past, and, and that is reflected in the what what species and how many species they have today. So some of the important uh, ecological forces that affect species diversity are abiotic influences like resource supply and harshness or stress. So how much light and nutrients is there that would be resource supply, for example. How harsh or stressful is the environment? We talked about how salt marshes have relatively low species diversity because they're so harsh and, and stressful. So even though there's a high supply of resources, light and nutrients in salt marshes, they have relatively few species because they're so harsh and stress. Uh, biotic interactions affect species diversity, so competition, predation, parasitism, facilitation. Um, these kind of things can increase species diversity or decrease species diversity. It just depends. Like competition can reduce species diversity if it's resulting in competitive exclusion with one dominant species taking over. But competition can also um, increase species diversity in some ways if it leads to sort of like niche differentiation and stuff. Um, same same with predation. Like preda predators could make some species scarce, which would reduce species diversity, but it could also uh, prevent a species from being competitively dominant and make room for other species, so it could increase species diversity. So exactly how biotic interactions affect species diversity is a little bit complicated and hard to predict, uh, but it is a thing. Uh, and then temporal stability or disturbance frequency, which is something we'll talk about more in the end of the semester, is, is pretty important. So um, it's not just how stress the stressful or harsh the environment is on average but it's what the but it's how stable the environment is and how often something really disastrous happens in that environment that can determine how uh, how much diversity it can support okay so final really interesting question about biodiversity is does loss of biodiversity matter who cares if we lose species um, well, I care, but first let's back up and, and say what do we mean by loss of biodiversity? Does that mean extinction o and only extinction or is there something more subtle to it? So there's actually more types of biodiversity loss than just extinction. Extinction is when a species is gone from the earth forever. And the species that I have as the example here is the carrier pigeon. Uh, it's a type of dove that was very, very abundant in North America until the 19th century when they were hunted to extinction. So uh, they also lost a lot of their habitat. So a combination of massive overhunting and uh, habitat loss eliminated this species from the earth forever. It's gone. There's only a few stuffed ones in museums anymore. So that's extinction. Uh, extirpation means that a species is extinct from a certain area, but it might still survive in other parts of the world. So I actually have two examples of extirpation. This is the cougar or mountain lion, and it, it survives in the western United States, and there's a remnant population that survives in South Florida called the Florida panther. Uh, but it used to also live throughout the east coast of Florida, or sorry, east coast of uh, the United States and in the Midwest of the United States, but it's extinct in those places, so it, we say that it's been extirpated from those places. Uh, this whale here is called a gray whale, and the gray whale is still found today in the Pacific Ocean, but it used to also be found in the Atlantic Ocean until it was hunted to extinction uh, by European whalers uh, hundreds of years ago. So it's uh, been extirpated from the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the thing about extirpation is it's potentially not as permanent as extinction because maybe uh, this species could be reintroduced from one of the areas where it still survives, although for something like the cougar or the whale, that would be tough to do, especially if conditions are changed in the environment that it used to live so that it wouldn't be able to survive there anymore. Okay, so a third type of biodiversity loss is where the species is technically not extinct and it's not even extirpated. Like there are still some of that species left, but they've just become very rare 
Um, so that is ecological extinctions. When a species has become so much more rare than it was originally that it's not really having any significant effect on the environment anymore. So the example species that I have here is the Atlantic cod and in the waters off of New England and um, Eastern Canada these cod were very very abundant and now they've been overfished to like less than 10% of their original population size and they're just not playing the same role in the food web that they used to before they reached this level of ecological extinction. Okay, so right now we're in a biodiversity crisis that some people call the Holocene extinction. The Holocene is the current um, geological era, so it, it's the right now period in Earth's history. And right now, extinction rate is greatly, greatly exceeding speciation rate. We're losing species much, much faster than nature's natural rate of uh, producing new species by speciation. So um, we, we know this because we have data on extinction. We can see that species are going extinct at a really alarming rate. Uh, even species that are beautiful, wonderful species that would have been great to keep around just um, for their majesty, like the uh, Chinese paddlefish and the Yangtze River dolphin, a, a really cool aquatic species that have gone extinct in the, the recent years. Um, and that's just rates of extinction. Uh, rates of extirpation and ecological extinction are probably even not higher than the rates of total extinction, but uh, they, they haven't been quantified as much. Um, so one of the examples of sort of the drastic change in Earth's biodiversity in recent times is the 99% population reduction in many species of pelagic sharks. So due to overfishing and bycatch, sharks are, uh, populations of many species are 1% or less or of what they were historically. So uh, that is ecological extinction and it means that whatever roles those species played in the environment are not being played anymore. So why is this biodiversity loss happening? There are several main categories of region reason. So the habitat related effects are part of them, pollution effects, over harvesting effects, species introduction effects, that's invasive species, disturbance effects, and persecution. So I'll just define what each of these six factors is real briefly. So habitat mediated effects, that could be um, you're totally losing the habitat, like if they cut down the rainforest that you lived in um, and you're a sloth or something that can't live anywhere except in a rainforest, then that would make you go extinct. Um, habitat fragmentation is also a problem. So if your habitat is getting broken up into smaller chunks, then you might not be able to survive, especially if you need a large continuous chunk of habitat to survive. That's particularly a problem for large vertebrates that need to range across a wide habitat. So if their habitat gets broken up into smaller pieces, they die. Uh, and then there's habitat alteration or degradation. So like technically your habitat is still there, but it's a little bit different and the, it's not as supportive of your survival as it was before it was impacted. Uh, then there's pollution. So pollution is when humans put anything harmful into the environment. So that could be toxic chemicals. Um, it could be an excessive amount of carbon dioxide, which leads to acidification and climate change. Uh, it could be an excessive amount of nutrients, which leads to eutrophication, where there's an overgrowth of harmful algae. Or it could be uh, the oceans filling up with plastic marine debris uh, and upsetting food webs as species eat plastic and die. Uh, okay, so over harvesting is a big problem for marine biodiversity. So over harvesting can be f from fishing or whaling or any kind of other harvest of living things from the ocean. We tend to overdo it and make the species that we were harvesting go extinct uh, or make uh, other species that we're accidentally catching or destroying along with the harvesting go extinct. Um, so there's the, the direct effects of fishing, but there's also indirect effects of fishing like trophic cascades. So um, when we remove the one species, it has a ripple effect through the food chain and can cause other species to be harmed as well.
Uh, and then species introductions. That's when we take a species that's not native to an area and introduce it uh, accidentally or on purpose. And sometimes that one species and so you would think that a species introduction would be increasing biodiversity, and it, it does increase biodiversity by one for that one species that you added. But the chances are that that one species will be competing with or eating or otherwise disturbing the species in its habitat. So um, you're reducing the number of species by a lot. So you're adding one species and poten but potentially getting, getting rid of a lot of species as that one species wreaks havoc on the environment. Um, and then disturbance. So humans do lots of things that disturb the environment and can uh, disrupt the survival of organisms. So ocean noise and traffic is one type of disturbance. So when we're driving tankers across the ocean that have really loud engines, it's hard for whales to hear and talk to each other. And that would be an example. And the traffic can be um, whacking into the whales and um, killing them. So that's an even worse kind of disturbance. Uh, and the final thing is, is sort of the saddest thing. It's where we're, we're not harvesting the species. Uh, we're just killing them because we're afraid of them or we hate them. So uh, that would be like shark nets used to kill sharks out of a fear of sharks or, or wolf traps used to kill wolves out of fear of wolves on land. So does loss of biodiversity matter? Who cares? Um, well, yes, loss of biodiversity does matter. And there, there's a lot of reasons why loss of biodiversity matters, why I think most humans should be concerned, well, all humans should be concerned about the loss of biodiversity. And th there's two main categories of reasons to care about the loss of biodiversity. One is that biodiversity has intrinsic value. So either because it's beautiful or to nature is beautiful or it's wrong to uh, destroy living things. We, we have various moral reasons and aesthetic reasons to preserve biodiversity. It's, we, we like it, it's beautiful, or it's, it's wrong to destroy it. Um, so some arguments for preserving biodiversity are these uh, intrinsic value reasons. Uh, and then there's some more kind of like pragmatic reasons related to the benefits to humanity of biodiverse ecosystems. And so there's the idea that there are these functions that natural communities and ecosystems play. They provide us with food and they clean our water and they protect our shorelines. And there's a huge variety of really beneficial things that natural ecosystems do. In fact, we, we wouldn't be able to live on Earth without these functions that are performed by natural ecosystems. Uh, and it turns out, uh, at least we think, anyways, that biodiversity enhances these ecosystem functions and that um, preserving or enhancing biodiversity can enhance these ecosystem functions that we benefit from. So we, we derive direct benefits from biodiversity. So this is that idea that I was talking about on the previous slide, the idea that ecosystem functions and services could be enhanced by biodiversity. So let's define real clearly what ecosystem functions are and what ecosystem services are. So ecosystem functions are aggregate properties of ecosystems and actions performed by ecosystems. So an ecosystem function is not like what one species does. It's sort of like a property or characteristic of the, of the whole ecosystem. So like um, primary production would be an ecosystem function. How much plant biomass does this ecosystem produce would be one of its ecosystem functions. Or what's its secondary production? How much animal biomass does it produce? That's obviously um, important to those of us that eat animals. You know, they want the marine ecosystem to produce a lot of fish. Uh, other ecosystem functions that are really important for nature as well as for humans are rates of um, biogeochemical cycling, like the rate that organic matter is decomposed and turned back into nutrients. Um, so the sort of the flip side of the primary production thing. Uh, and then there's these aggregate properties of ecosystems, like how stable the ecosystem is, how well it is to able to resist disturbance, and how well it's able to bounce back from a disturbance. Um, so those sort of properties of an ecosystem, kind of like if you're describing a material, you could describe like its strength or its flexibility or its uh, impact resistance. Um, 
and for ecosystems we can describe those kind of properties as well so in this idea of ecosystem functions it's almost like we're thinking of the ecosystem as a, a machine or a, a vehicle or something and we're describing its characteristics and how well how well it does them and how well it functions um, so ecosystem services are kind of a twist on the ecosystem functions concept ecosystem services are more focused on humans and the so basically they're like ecosystem functions in terms of their benefits to humanity so it's not just what the ecosystems are doing uh, for other components of the ecosystem but what ecosystems are specifically doing for for humans so um, the uh, amount that the ecosystems provide food and clean water to humans the amount that the ecosystems protect our coastlines the amount that the ecosystems help regulate the climate like we talked about how seagrasses salt marsh and mangroves sequester carbon and can have a, a beneficial effect on maintaining climate stability and processing uh, assessing of wastes so decomposer communities and um, producer com are able to break down organic wastes and turn them into inorganic wastes and then producer communities are able to absorb those inorganic wastes so um, ecosystems provide all these benefits to us and if we think about how much it would cost to do all of these things like in a factory or just paying to do it in a man-made kind of way um, it would be really really expensive to try to do all of these things ourselves without the natural ecosystem doing it for us so if you think about like how expensive it would be to support a moon base or something where there's no natural ecosystems doing some of the work for you um, then that should be a good reminder that we really need to make sure that we maintain the ecosystem functions that we've been blessed with here on planet earth all right so there is a link between biodiversity and ecosystem functions so the number of species the variety of life in the environment and how well the ecosystem functions uh, are related or we think they are anyways that's the theory um, uh, so the the question that's the basis of the theory is what is the nature of the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem functions um, and so we, we basically think that there's a positive relationship. The more biodiversity there is, the more uh, e consistent ecosystem functions you get. Um, but it's, it's a little more complicated than that. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more about the development of biodiversity ecosystem function theory and how the theory arose from conceptual models of what happens as species are lost from the environment. So on this slide here, I'm showing four different models that were sort of described by science uh, by ecologists uh, that describe what happens as you increase the number of species what happens to the uh, rate of ecosystem function or the ecosystem process rate which would be the thing like primary production or water filtration capacity or, or whatever the functional function performed by the ecosystem is um, these models describe how that function is related to the number of species in the ecosystem. So let's talk about one of the simplest models first, and then we'll talk about a more complicated model. So one of the earliest models was from the famous ecologist MacArthur in 1955, and it was called the diversity stability hypothesis. MacArthur basically just said that as you increase the number of species, the stability or productivity or functionality of the environment went up. So it's, it's just a simple relationship. Uh, you got more species, the environment works better. Uh, you decrease the number of species, the environment works worse. So this is the most basic BDEF relationship. Um, so there were some uh, different uh, takes on that. Some people said, uh, it's really not like a linear slope like MacArthur said. Uh, Walker in 1992 said that he thought species were pretty redundant with each other for the most part. So you could actually lose a lot of species um, and you wouldn't really see much happening until uh, b because most of the species were redundant with each other. And it's only when you get to really low levels of biodiversity that you'd eventually start to see a drop-off in ecosystem function. 
Um, so the, the third model, B here, uh, Ehrlich and Ehrlich articulated in their 1981 book, um, was called the rivet hypothesis. And it sort of combined MacArthur's diversity stability hypothesis and the redundancy hypothesis and said that um, on average, as you lose species, you're only going to lose a little bit of ecosystem function for the most part. But there's always a chance with every species that you lose that something really bad could happen and you could drop to a much lower level of ecosystem functioning. And the reason they called it the rivet hypothesis was because of analogy with um, the rivets on an airplane. Um, the idea was if so airplanes are held together by these little fasteners that hold metal plates together and the fasteners are called rivets um, so there's lots and lots of rivets that hold the wings together and hold the wings on the airplane so if a rivet pops out it's usually no big deal because there's plenty of other rivets that, that keep the ecosystem together i mean the plane might be just like a little bit more unstable but you're probably okay um, but every time you pop another rivet, there's more of a chance that the wings will just fall off the airplane and disaster will occur. So that's like having this big drop in diversity from um, the top of the line to the bottom of the, uh, the region. So um, th that's the rivet hypothesis, the idea that you'll probably be all right when you lose a species, but there's always a chance that you lost a species that was sort of that last one that was holding the, the ecosystem together. Now you're really in trouble. Um, in the Caribbean, when we were reducing species diversity of uh, grazers by overfishing on coral reefs, um, some places didn't see much impact until the final rivet was pulled and they lost the long-spined sea urchins, and then they really saw an uh, ecosystem collapse at that point where they lost a lot of the coral reef functions. Um, okay, so the then sort of like the devil's advocate hypothesis, the idiosyncratic hypothesis, um, is that um, each species does something really different in the environment. So losing one particular species is doesn't necessarily reduce the overall function of the environment in that you know ecosystem function might actually increase as you lose species, or it might decrease, uh, but then it might go back up again. And every time you lose a species, you never really know if it's going to go up or down. It's just kind of a chaotic or idiosyncratic. Idiosyncratic means like without a pattern. So it just means that it's all over the place. Like you can't really predict a general trend because the individual species are all so different and they interact in so many different ways. So there's all these theories about how biodiversity loss will affect ecosystems, but it wasn't until the 1990s that people started to actually do experiments to test if any of these theories really applied. So, oh yeah, um, I w want to say uh, what one more theory uh, to sort of explain how we think um, biodiversity leads to stability, and, and that's what we call the portfolio effect. Um, it's based on the idea of a stock portfolio. So the stocks are like investments that people can make like they they um, put their money in a certain company and they get uh, fractional ownership of that company if the company does well then uh, the value of their stock rises and they can sell it for more money than they bought it for um, but the thing is that w an individual company is has like um, a chance of being really variable like it might do well or it might do terrible and so you don't usually want to put all your money in just one stock you want to have it dispersed uh, throughout a stock portfolio so you have like money in some stocks that and hopefully some of hopefully some of them will go up and most of them will go up and maybe a few of them will go down but um, the losses will be balanced out by the gains and you'll have like a steady investment that's hopefully growing so um, the idea in nature is that you've got these m many different species uh, and so in this diagram you've got five different species and the average uh, oh sorry and the abundance of any one particular species at least in this situation is all over the place it goes up and it goes down and it's all over all around um, but 
if you average the five species together, um, and that's what the thick black line is, um, then that average of all five species, it still goes up and down, but it's more stable over time than any one of the individual species. So um, temporal stability is conferred by diversity. So basically like the overall um, productivity or whatever it is that these species are providing is more stable than the productivity or abundance of any one of the species. And it's the fact that you've got this combined uh, sort of averaging out portfolio effect that leads to that greater stability. All right, so uh, one of the first scientists that tested some of these theories of how biodiversity would affect ecosystem function was David Tillman, who was, a, was oh, I think he's still a, a scientist at uh, a big Midwestern university. And in the Midwest they have, of the United States, they have these prairie ecosystems, which are beautiful grasslands with a lot of different types of grass and, and flowers. And um, well, a lot of them have been converted to cropland where there's no diversity anymore because they most crops are, are monocultures. But um, in, in natural prairies, there's a lot of diversity. And so prairies are a good test system to study the effects of biodiversity in general. And so David Tillman and his army of undergraduate students set up all of these plots in a field and um, so the field was divided into all these different plots and the different plots had different uh, randomized treatments that had like different numbers of species and different combinations of species of prairie plants and any species that weren't supposed to be there the undergraduates would have to pick it out and so painstakingly weeding the fields and so uh, David Tillman was able to compare plots that had just one species for all the different possible types of species, as well as plots that had um, diverse combinations of many different species. And what he found was that the more plant diversity he had, the more plant biomass he would have at the end of the experiment. Even though each plot was starting with the same amount of bare dirt and seeds, if you had a greater variety, that uh, led to a greater total plant biomass. So it, it kind of proved the um, diversity stability hypothesis and um, some of the other hypotheses that suggested diversity would confer a greater ecosystem function. So the initial hypothesis for how this effect was taking place was the idea of niche complementarity. So the idea is that each species uses a little bit different type of resources or a little bit different part of the environment uh, but then when you put all the species together um, they're taking advantage of uh, the environment more completely like one species might live in the dry areas of the plot another in the wetter areas of the plot uh, maybe one species has shallow roots and the other has deep roots and so there's sort of like dividing up the environment in ways that help them as a whole take better advantage of the environment and achieve a greater total level of productivity than any one little species alone that's not as uh, as productive or not not uh, having as high a level of whatever the ecosystem function is that you're interested in so David Tillman published this and a lot of people were really excited about it but in part because the paper got so much attention it also attracted a lot of critics and some people said they thought that David Tillman's results were misleading and that it wasn't really niche complementarity that was going on they thought that it was what they called a sampling effect and they thought that the reason David Tillman was finding more ecosystem function in his more diverse plots was simply because if you had more species you're more likely to include a species that was like really dominant uh, like one species that was able to have a high biomass so the more species you have the more likely it will be that you're including one of the species that just happens to be a really productive species and so it's not really that the number of species that you have is just the fact that you have this one really good species that's uh, that's the reason so this is sort of what the naysayers were saying uh, but David Tillman kind of came back with uh, against that in, in a good way and he said you know what 
you're right there there probably are sampling effects and niche complementarity effects and the sampling effects are partly why we see an effect of diversity but but he said that sampling effects are still diversity effects like it's still the same result it still means that the more species you have the greater the level of ecosystem function is so um, uh, there have been a lot more ecosystem function experiments done since David Tillman did them and perhaps you'll do a biodiversity ecosystem function experiment at some point um, and I'd like you to know how these experiments are, are typically done so um, usually uh, in one of these experiments you're comparing the ecosystem function of monocultures which are groups of just uh, one species at, uh, at a time versus polycultures which are uh, groups of multiple species. So um, usually you do all the species by themselves to figure out how productive they are by themselves um, and then you compare that to the mix. So uh, you want to look at the average performance of monocultures to the performance of polycultures and see if the polycultures which is the multi-species mixes do better on average than the monocultures. And there's sort of like two levels of how much better the polycultures can be than the monocultures. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Okay, so this is how you define better performance. So uh, non-transgressive yielding is the kind of like lower type of ecosystem function. So it means that the ecosystem function of the polyculture is better than the average ecosystem function of the monocultures but it's not it's not better than the best of the monocultures so maybe like the mix is better than um, the average of the a's the b's and the c's by themselves but maybe one of these by themselves was actually better than the mix um, and or, or equal to the the mix uh, and then there's transgressive overyielding, which means that the ecosystem function of the polycultures was actually better than even the best one of the monocultures and the that can't happen with just a sampling effect um, you have to have some niche complementarity or some sort of facilitation going on to get transgressive over yielding so this is the kind of more powerful type of biodiversity ecosystem function uh, and this is what that looks like those two situations in graphs so the first one here is um, non-trans well actually we'll go with the second one first so non-transgressive over yielding means that the average uh, that the polyculture does better than the average of the monocultures so if you average this one this one and this one you get this uh, value for the average of the monocultures and so the polyculture is better than the average but look species one was actually better than the polyculture so the polyculture did not do better than the best species it only did better than the average of the monocultures so this was non-transgressive over yielding it's kind of like a weak uh, biodiversity ecosystem function effect um, but in this top situation transgressive over yielding um, the polyculture is still better than the average of the monocultures um, but it's also better than even the best one of the um, monocultures so that means that there's really something going on niche complementarity or, or facilitation or of some kind where the mix of species is better than any one species by itself okay so the early studies of biodiversity and ecosystem function were with these uh, prairie plants and like I said they attracted a lot of criticism and because you know they were so revolutionary and, and it was such an important idea that it, it's a good thing that there was a lot of criticism it means that the science was was advancing um, and one of the criticisms was that not all species in the world are plants and these studies of biodiversity effects in plant communities might not necessarily apply to animal communities or or they might not apply when animals are allowed to roam into the plant communities. Um, we, we know, for example, that consumers, animals, can have really strong effects on ecosystems, like uh, keystone species, for example, like the starfish that we talked about in the rocky intertidal um, 
unit can the presence or absence of just one species can have a huge effect if that one species is a predator and so um, uh, we, we think that maybe estimating how important biodiversity ecosystem functions are based on plants might actually be underestimating how important biodiversity ecosystem functions are because um, if you because species individual species are really really valuable when those species are higher in the food chain um, uh, another thing is you know if you're doing a study like this in a simulated environment and you're keeping out a lot of the natural organisms that would historically be found in that environment you might not really be simulating nature as well as you should be um, although you know it would be tough to have like a bison in each one of these little plots um, unless the plots were much bigger and, and same with uh, same with wolves so um, yeah, so as, as I mentioned, uh, we know from various sort of food web studies, trophic ecology studies in marine and terrestrial ecosystems that, that predators have really strong effects that can ripple through the food chain in these interactions that we call trophic cascades. And the classic trophic cascade example is where sea otters eat sea urchins and the sea urchins eat kelp so that uh, these two negative effects lead to an indirect positive effect of the sea urchins on the kelp. So the sea urchins are sort of like, or, or sorry, the sea otters are necessary for the kelp survival because without the sea urchins, um, the, or sorry, without the sea otters, the urchins get overpopulated and eat all the kelp. Uh, and that's something that has been observed in, in Alaska kelp beds. Um, so that's sort of the simple story of consumer effects of, of top-down control through a simple food chain um, but how does our understanding of biodiversity influence uh, our, our models of these top-down effects like what happens when we consider the fact that there's actually uh, not necessarily just one predator species that's controlling a prey but there might be diffuse predation uh, there might be multiple predator species in some ecosystems and so for that we'll contrast the Alaska kelp beds versus California kelp beds so in Alaska kelp beds sea urchins are the major most important eater or sorry I keep saying urchins when I mean otters in in Alaska kelp beds the sea otters are the major important consumer of sea urchins but in California kelp beds there's some other species that also eat sea urchins like uh, California spiny lobsters and California sheep's head will also eat urchins and they don't these things don't live in Alaska uh, but they do live in California so in California there haven't been very many sea otters for a long period of time since they were over hunted for their fur but there have still been a reasonable amount of spiny lobsters and sheep's head and so those things have been controlling the abundance of the sea urchins in the absence of sea otters and that's sort of maintained the kelp beds and so this diffuse predation like a little bit of predation by the lobsters some by the sea otters and some by the sheep's head is um, different than just one species that's the strong and only predator all right, so here's that uh, classic uh, cascade again, um, where a decrease in sea otters causes an increase in sea urchins and a decrease in kelp. Um, so, and, and we're trying to now sort of translate this classic food chain cascade into a system that is more diverse, that has multiple species at uh, these trophic levels. So um, some of the things that we know are that when we're losing species in the real world uh, although we are losing plant species real world biodiversity loss um, means we're not just losing plant species and in fact we're largely losing predator species predators for multiple reasons are particularly vulnerable to extinction um, so we're probably more likely to lose diversity from the upper levels in the food chain relative to the lower levels and predator diversity loss can have big effects um, uh, similar to the loss of predators overall and herbivore diversity like the diversity of grazers can also um, 
be Im important. Um, the diversity of grazers can sort of stabilize the community of grazers and mean that they're not so affected by predators, for better or worse. And so some of the scientists that have studied this are myself. I did a paper on this in uh, seaweed communities in North Carolina um, that is something that you can look up if you're interested. And uh, another si great scientist, greater than myself actually, uh, Jarrett Burns, who's uh, now teaching in Boston, um, he did this study on kelp forest ecosystems where he had multiple species of predators in the kelp bed, that's what we see here, and uh, multiple species of kelp eating grazers. And he manipulated the diversity of each of these groups independently and saw um, that uh, you had this interesting effect where you, wouldn't, you didn't have to totally lose predators to have a trophic cascade, you could just uh, decrease predator diversity and get a trophic cascade and yet if you decrease increased the herbivore diversity they would be more resistant to a cascade okay so there's this scientist named uh, J Emmett Duffy who uh, tried to combine some of the things that we've been talking about about food chains with some of the things that we've been talking about about biodiversity loss and bring these two fields of ecology, the uh, trophic ecology that's sort of the prediction of trophic cascades and stuff together with uh, the field of biodiversity and ecosystem function where you're studying the relationships between biodiversity loss and the functions of ecosystem. And so in, in thinking about this, he came up with a variety of hypotheses labeled H1 through H7. I think I, I skipped um, H6 because it was kind of redundant with some of the other hypotheses. So I'm going to attempt to explain each of these hypotheses so that you all can understand them. So the first hypothesis that Duffy came up with was that there is extinction bias by trophic level and that leads to weaker top-down control. So extinction bias by trophic level means that not all trophic levels are equally likely to be losing species. It means that higher trophic levels, predators, those trophic levels are more likely to be experiencing extinctions because predators, for a variety of reasons, such as lower population sizes and requiring larger home ranges, they're more likely to go extinct when the environment is impacted by humans than uh, lower trophic level species are. So uh, in an impacted environment, you're going to disproportionately be losing predators and that loss of predators means there will be weaker top-down control. Okay, so the second hypothesis is that there is lower functional redundancy at higher trophic levels. So that means uh, unlike lower trophic levels where there are a lot of species that are pretty much doing the same thing, at higher trophic levels um, the loss of one species can have really big effects because there might not be any other predator that did what that predator was doing. That, that predator uh, was really functionally unique and there's nothing else that can do what that one predator did. So it's bad to lose predators for that reason. Um, and that's uh, one, of the, one of the things that enhances uh, H1 there. Uh, okay, so uh, H3. Uh, prey diversity enhances resistance to consumption. This is the idea that if you have a lot of prey species, like a lot of species of uh, um, grazers, then some of them will be resistant to being eaten by predators. So um, that means that you're less likely to have a cascading effect through the, the food chain. And that's also um, part of a uh, hypothesis for diverse prey assemblages are more stable so because uh, prey diversity enhances resistance to consumption meaning like if you've got a lot of species of prey there's probably going to be some that the predators don't like to eat and so overall there will be more left um, that means that the overall amount of prey will be more stable over time if the prey community is diverse and that means that the functions performed by the prey are probably also more stable over time um, the fifth hypothesis, more consumer diversity reduces prey biomass. So this is kind of a counter effect. If you've got uh, a lot of different types of consumers, like a lot of different types of grazers or a lot of different types of predators, 
um, they will be more effective at reducing the amount of the thing that they eat. So that's kind of like Jarrett Burns' experiment in the kelp bed. If he had a lot of different species of uh, predators, they were more effective at getting rid of the grazers. Um, the seventh hypothesis, prey diversity reduces penetrance of trophic cascades. Um, that means, so, so trophic cascades are these ripple effects from high trophic levels, high predators, down the food chain, potentially all the way to plants. But food chains don't, or sorry, trophic cascades don't always ripple all the way down to the level of plants. Um, sometimes they sort of fizzle out after going only one or two links through the food chain. And the idea is that if there's a lot of prey diversity, because some of the prey will be resistant to consumption, um, then the trophic cascade won't actually ripple all the way down to the plants. It'll sort of affect maybe the just the immediate prey of the predators, but it won't get any further than that. All right, so um, food webs, I hope I've convinced you that they're like very, very useful models for predicting uh, ecological effects in communities uh, and I have hopefully also given you the idea that it's sort of difficult to build these food web models and have them accurately reflect what's really eating what in the environment so there are a variety of tools that scientists have however to figure out what's eating what out in the environment and to build realistic food webs so some of them are simple tools like field observations. So you can just go out and observe nature and see what's eating what. The only thing is that it takes a long time and it's usually not quantitative. And particularly in an underwater environment, you might not be able to see what's going on very well. And it's just really hard to directly observe things at a detailed enough level to make a, a food web like, um, you know, maybe you can see that little fish are pecking at something in the water, but and it's probably zooplankton, but you can't, don't know exactly what type of zooplankton it is because the zooplankton are too small to see. So anyways, there's a lot of limitations to field observations. Uh, you can also do lab observations and experiments. So uh, putting species in a more controlled environment, like putting a crab in a dish with some snails and seeing if it eats the snails, um, that uh, uh, might allow you to view the things closer up and, and make some observations that you wouldn't be able to make at the in the field. But there are some problems with those lab observations and experiments as well. Like it's it's hard to, and expensive to maintain things in the lab, particularly if they're large organisms. And the lab environment is not always that realistic. Like maybe you're only giving that species one possible prey choice and it will eat that thing in the lab even though it wouldn't really eat it very often in the environment. So the realism of results that you get from observing things in the lab is questionable. Um, fortunately, we do have other tools. Uh, one tool is gut contents and fecal analysis. So you basically squeeze an organism until it, it poops or, or you pick up its poop from the environment or you kill it and cut open its stomach and look at what's in its gut or you uh, uh, squirt water down its throat until it vomits and you look at the vomit. Uh, none of these are like really glamorous uh, things, but they, they let you see what's in an organism's stomach and or what was in an organism's stomach and uh, that lets you know what it ate, or at least what it ate right before you looked at its stomach contents. Uh, well, the problem is that this is labor intensive. Uh, you got to catch the organisms and um, pro usually kill them and it's, it's gross and um, it's difficult because sometimes the material is half digested and it's hard to tell exactly what species were in there. And also, it's only giving you a snapshot of the diet of that organism. It's, it's only what it ate right then. So if someone killed you and cut your stomach out right now, what would they find inside it? Um, hopefully that doesn't happen to you, but uh, whatever they did fi find inside it, it would tell them what you ate just recently but it wouldn't necessarily tell them what you eat normally all the time unless you're, what you happen to eat today is exactly the same as what you always eat and you're a very consistent eater. Um, I, I know for most people, humans have a varied diet and, and what's in your stomach at any one moment is probably not a perfect representation of your overall diet. So if you wanted to get a, a 
good overall characterization of what the diet of the species was. You'd have to kill and cut open a lot of the organisms and uh, figure out what the average stomach contents were. So, so that's tough and it kills a lot of animals. Uh, another thing that you can do though that's uh, a little more technologically sophisticated is look at chemical indicators of the diet. So um, there are some chemical characteristics like the stable isotope composition of body tissues that reflect the diet of an organism. So what an organism eats is uh, ends up affecting the makeup of its uh, chemistry or the isotopic composition of the elements in its body. And that can allow us, and that's something that sort of changes gradually for an organism, like um, its chemical composition doesn't change the instant it eats a new thing. It's something that sort of builds up over time. So we call it an integrated measure, meaning that it's sort of like looking at over a long period of time, what kinds of foods did this, or did this organism eat? So uh, it has an advantage compared to gut contents that it's sort of like a more uh, long-term uh, indicator of what something was eating. The problem is that it's relatively low resolution and ambiguous. So if you're actually seeing the organism in the gut contents analysis, then you know like, okay, well, it ate a frog because I see a frog in its stomach. Uh, but if you're just looking at the isotopes, you're like, well, its isotope ratio was 6.7, so it might have been eating frogs, but it could have been eating salamanders. So um, you don't, there's some ambiguity in the chemical indicators of diet that you don't have in the gut contents analysis. So none of these four methods is perfect. And if you want to make a good food web, you probably have to use multiple ones of these methods. All right, so I'm going to talk some more about the stable isotope method in particular. So hopefully in your chemistry classes, you've learned already what stable isotopes are, but uh, I feel like a reminder never hurts when it comes to chemistry. So I am going to review what stable isotopes are. So stable isotopes are versions of elements that differ in the numbers of neutrons that they have. So uh, an elements are defined by how many protons they have. So uh, an atom that has six protons is a carbon atom, no matter what. If it's an atom with six protons, it's a carbon atom. Um, and usually there's the, in a, in a neutrally charged atom, there's the same number of electrons as protons. But the, there's another type of particle that is in most atoms called the neutron. And the neutrons, they don't have any charge, electrical charge to them, they're neutrally charged. That's why they're called neutrons. And the number of neutrons is not always the same as the number of protons and electrons. It can vary a little bit. So a carbon atom, it usually has six of each kind of subatomic particle. It's got six protons, um, protons, six. It's got six electrons, which are not shown, but the electrons would be buzzing around the outside of the atom. Make some little dashes on there to indicate that the electrons are fast and they're buzzing around the outside of the atom. Um, and it's got six uh, neutrons, so six neutrons, so um, in the nucleus. And that's, that's the typical average carbon atom. So they call it carbon-12 because it's, that's its mass number. And that's the, the 12 is the sum of basically the number of protons and the number of neutrons. So since it's got six protons and 12, uh, sorry, six protons and six neutrons, its mass number is 12. The electrons are too small to affect the mass number. Um, so the atomic number is six, that's the number of protons. Protons. And the mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. So what you see on the right hand part here is an alternate version of carbon that instead of having, I mean it still has six protons like they all do, but now it's got eight neutrons. And so its total atomic number, or sorry, its total mass number is 14. So they call it 14 carbon or, or carbon 14. And um, it's, 
pretty much the same as regular carbon in most ways, except it's a little bit heavier because it's got two extra protons, or sorry, two extra neutrons, and those two extra neutrons add a little bit of weight to it. Um, the other thing is that uh, this version of carbon that's got the extra neutrons is going to be radioactive, but I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Anyways, um, so these different versions of atoms that vary in the number of neutrons, they're not equally common in nature. Like in nature, by far, carbon-12 is the most common kind. And carbon-14 or carbon-13 are, are a lot more rare. But um, there are some differences and, and some patterns in where you find the rare uh, extra heavy or light versions of the isotopes. So uh, there's also this interesting effect in nature where there's natural sorting processes that skew the ratios of heavy versus light isotopes. So it might be that, you know, in most of the world you have 99% carbon-12 and 1% carbon-13, but maybe like in some places it's a little more concentrated than that and uh, it's 99.9% .9 carbon-12 and only 0.1% carbon-13. So, um, th and there's natural sorting processes that can affect those ratios. So those natural sorting processes that lead to different ratios of different isotopes are the basis for the technique of figuring out what ate what in the food chain. And I'll talk about that in the upcoming slides. Okay, uh, well first, first I have to talk about how we express uh, isotope ratios. So um, the simplest way to affect, uh, express the ratio of two different kinds of isotopes is to use this letter R. So R is the ratio of the heavy to the light isotope. So the, for example, the R for 13C versus 12C is the ratio of the um, uh, 13 carbon to 12 carbon in the environment. So that ratio is about 1 out of 100. So there's, uh, like I said, there's about 1 carbon 13 on Earth for every 100 carbon 12s. So that R value is uh, p 0 0.01, uh, more or less. The thing is that that value, 0 0.01, the, de the fine decimal points of that value could actually vary from place to place. And that's where your clues might be into um, what type of material you're looking at or where it came from. Uh, it's these sort of fine variations in the relative amount of carbon-13 to carbon-12 is the signal that we're looking for. Um, so in various biological materials that contain carbon, you can look at and measure what the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 is. And in Florida seagrass, in a study that I did it several years ago, the ratio was this number. So it's approximately 0 0.01, but it differs in the fine decimal points here. I would like you guys to write that number down on a piece of paper uh, because you'll do a, a problem based on that. So. You can pause the slide and write that number down, the carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio for Florida seagrass. All right, now, uh, stable nitrogen isotopes. Uh, nitrogen is also a really common element in living things. It's in all living things. And nitrogen has some uh, different isotopes that we can use in the environment. Oh, you know, th there's, there's something that I forgot to explain. It's, it's why we're calling these things stable isotopes. Um, so stable means that this isotope will last forever, basically, till the end of the universe. Um, so the, if there are isotopes, though, that are not stable, meaning that they're radioactive and they will spontaneously decay and break down into another element. Uh, but stable isotopes, uh, like a stable isotope of nitrogen, it will always be nitrogen. It's not going to break down or radioactively decay. Um, so stable isotopes they they may differ in their abundance but like they're they're stable over time okay anyways uh, the stable isotopes of nitrogen that are common on earth are 15n and 14n and their ratio is about four 15ns for every 1000 14ns or 0.004 um, but that ratio does vary from place to place 
uh, in the air the ratio of 15 and to 14 and is this and so this is a number that you need to pause the slide and write down all right something that complicates the expression of stable isotope ratios is that the differences that we're looking at in the stable isotope ratios are very small like they're out here in the decimal points of the number and it can be kind of hard to work with these numbers where it's it's the same all the way up to these last little decimal points um, so we have a, a way of expressing the stable isotope ratios as their deviations from the ratio in a standard material and I'll show you the math for doing that in a second what I want to do just now is tell you what the standard materials are that we use to be like what the standard ratio of 13 C to 12 C is and what the standard ratio of 15 N to 14 N is so for carbon in biological studies the standard ratio is this type of rock called PD belemnite where the ratio is this so you need to write down this ratio and the standard for nitrogen isotope studies is the 15n to 14n ratio of nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, which is this number here. Uh, so write that down. Uh, so interesting story about PD belemnite that actually kind of relates to uh, marine ecology. So PD belemnite is a fossil sediment uh, type of calcium carbonate that is made of the calcium carbonate from fossil cephalopod shells. Cephalopods are uh, squids, cuttlefish, uh, nautiluses, these tentacled mollusks. Um, so in the Cretaceous period 80 million years ago these things were abundant in the shallow seas over what is now South Carolina and they're shells accumulated in large amounts in the sediments and so there's this type of rock that's basically made out of <coughs> the shells of these type of cephalopods and, and for some reason we decided that we were going to use that as the standard ratio uh, the the ratio of 13c to 12c in these fossils was going to be our standard that we compared everything else to uh, the the pd were actually a native american culture that lived in South Carolina and there was a typical sad story where they were displaced by the European colonists um, but their their descendants do still try to preserve the culture um, and I don't know if they're proud that they have this special sediment that's used in science all over the world but uh, I, I hope that's something that they can be proud of all right um, so isotopic fractionation I, I mentioned that there were these sorting processes in nature that would kind of change the mixture of the heavy to light versions of uh, an isotope and there are so uh, it's a variety of things anything that concentrates or dilutes the typical ratio of heavy to light isotopes like something that so uh, for the 13 c to 12 c ratio something that would um, cause an increase or decrease in the uh, relative abundance of one of the isotopes would be what we call a, a fractionating process so um, some physical processes can can sort of select for or against the heavy or light isotopes so evaporation and precipitation are examples um, so if a material is evaporating usually the lighter atoms uh, will be the ones that evaporate first leaving the heavier ones behind so that can skew the ratio opposite thing happens in precipitation it's the heavier ones that tend to condense first and would precip precipitate more um, and there's a lot of biological and chemical processes that occur in living things that um, can skew the ratio so photosynthesis uh, changes the ratio of heavy to light carbon relative to the source of carbon that's being used for photosynthesis so does respiration and excretion basically anything that's happening in the body of a living thing is uh, somewhat selective for either the heavy or the light isotope and therefore uh, as living things transform matter you end up with these uh, adjustments in the isotope ratios from what the original source was and that can sort of help you trace things through the food chain and that's uh, and one of the major biological processes that skews or uh, uh, or uh, changes the ratio of heavy to light isotopes is called trophic fractionation so trophic means as you go up the food chain so 
as you go up the food chain from plants to you know plant eating animals like a cow got to make a real simple drawing here of a cow uh, there we go perfect um, so um, as you go up the food chain from the cow to the wolf or whatever eats a cow dinosaur I guess probably dinosaurs would eat cows um, uh, you, the, the trophic fractionation let's give him some tiny arms deep, deep. tail um, so as you, as you go up the food chain uh, there's a change in this ratio of uh, um, carbon and nitrogen isotopes uh, because of all the biological processes that sort of transform the matter as it goes from being grass to being cow and that transform it as it goes from being cow to being Tyrannosaurus. Just for the record, um, Tyrannosaurus was not contemporary with cows. They were extinct long before cows evolved. This is just an example, hypothetical example. Uh, okay, so, um, right, so we were talking about how we express these differences in our differences in the ratio of heavy to light isotopes in a standard material and so we have the special way of expressing it um, and we call those del values this greek lowercase d which you can type by using the symbol font on your computer you type a lowercase d then you change the font to symbol font to make this del symbol um, uh, that's calculated like this so for the del 13 c is you take the ratio of heavy to light carbon in your sample and divide it by the ratio of heavy to light carbon in PD bolemnite, your standard material. Uh, then you subtract one from that and you times the whole thing by a thousand. Um, and similar idea for nitrogen, you take the ratio of heavy to light nit nitrogen in your sample you divide it by the ratio of heavy to light nitrogen in your standard material, which for nitrogen is air. Um, you subtract 1 and times by 1,000. So I want you to, before you go to the next slide, pause this slide and figure out all three of these del values. The del value for PD bolemnite, the del value for del 13C, and the del value for Florida seagrass. So pause it now because I'm about to give you some of the answers. Okay, so the answer for PD bolemnite and air is zero because um, in these cases the sample and the standard material are the same thing so um, the equation comes out to be zero. Uh, but for Florida seagrass you'd actually get some answer and I think it's around negative 14, uh, negative 14 point something. So it is possible to have a negative del value. It simply means that your sample material has a uh, lower concentration of the heavy isotope relative to the light isotope than the standard material does. So if uh, your sample material has more of the heavy isotope than the standard material does, you get a positive del value. If your sample material has less of the heavy isotope the, than the um, standard material does, then you get a negative del value. Okay, so um, let's talk about some of the biological effects that can skew the ratio of 13C to 12C. So photosynthesis, all kinds of photosynthesis uh, tend to select 12C and incorporate 12C into organic matter at a greater rate than they incorporate 13C into organic matter. So if you take the carbon source like the carbon dioxide in the air and compare it to the amount of, uh, and, and compare the ratio of 13 to 12 C in the source versus 13 C to 12 C in the, uh, in the plant matter, the ratio of 13 C to 12 C in the plant matter will be lower because there'll be relatively more 12 C in the plant matter. Um, but some kinds of photosynthesis skew that ratio more than others. So some are types of photosynthesis are really selective for the 12C and other types of photosynthesis are not as selective for the 12C and they don't change the ratio that much. Um, also, depending on where the carbon source is coming from for the photosynthesis, that can affect things. So uh, 
um, whether they're using atmospheric carbon dioxide as their carbon source or if they're using bicarbonate dissolved in water for the carbon source. These tend to have different uh, 13C to 12Cs to begin with, so that can also affect the ratio. Um, and then like the ratio uh, that you find of 13C to carbon, 13C to 12C in animals is based on the ratio that it was in the plants that they eat or the plants that what they ate ate. Uh, so an interesting little fact here is that in America our diet is based largely on corn because um, we grow a lot of corn here, we eat a lot of stuff that's sweetened with corn syrup, and we eat a lot of factory raised uh, chicken, beef, and pork that is fed corn or uh, and so our isotope ratios of carbon are very similar to the isotope ratios of corn because basically our bodies are made out of carbon that came from corn. So if you compared uh, American isotope ratios to European isotope ratios, it would be really obvious to tell the American from their isotope ratios. All right, um, so that was biological effects on carbon, now nitrogen. So uh, in nitrogen, the main biological effect on this ratio is that excretion tends to get rid of the light form of nitrogen, and therefore the heavy form of nitrogen will accumulate more in the living things. So uh, it's basically peeing out the 14N and building up the 15N. So uh, the, what it, whatever it eats has a certain ratio of 14N to 15N. Oh, or sorry, we do the ratios as 15N we always do heavy over light in the ratios. 15N to 14N is, so whatever this ratio of 15N to 14N is in, let's make this a fish, in the fish that uh, the tuna eats, um, the ratio of 15N to 14N in the tuna is going to be higher than the ratio in this smaller fish that it ate. So 15N to 14N ratio increases with trophic level, uh, and the del 15N uh, actually uh, goes up about three parts per thousand for every trophic level you go up because of this uh, increase in the amount of 15N in as you go up the food chain. Uh, yeah, so that's trophic fractionation, and these are the amounts that the del values are skewed as you go from the food source to the consumer, uh, you get this shift in carbon of about adding one uh, point, uh, one, one parts per thousand to the del value, del 13C value, and adding about three parts per thousand to the uh, del 15N value. These are just like approximate numbers, and they do kind of vary depending on the organism. So if you want to do a really detailed study, you need to actually measure how much the um, isotope ratios increase for that particular organism that you study. Uh, so there's, but I'm just giving you the basic information for this class. Okay, so you can actually use this knowledge that um, as something is, uh, some, well, let's, let's focus on the predator. So as this predator here, a uh, killifish, um, it, it's got this certain ratio of del 15N and del carbon C, and we can sort of plot its ratios of del 15N and del carbon C on this graph here. So this would be about negative, negative 14 for the del carbon, and um, for the this, it's going to be about 7 for the um, del 15N. So um, you can make this biplot, which means basically it's an XY graph where you've got the, d you always have the del 13C on the X axis and the del 15N on the Y axis. So if you're enriching things, getting heavier in uh, the N isotope, you're moving up on the Y axis. If you're getting heavier in, in a higher ratio of 13C, then you're moving uh, right on the X axis.
Uh, okay, so anyways, if you know that this um, predator must, and I guess we'll just start the point is at the mouth of the predator. If you know that it the its uh, ratio of um, uh, or its values of del 15n and del 13c are about one higher in del 13c and one and three higher in del 15n than its prey, then you can figure out where its prey must have been in terms of its ratio. And then if you have analyzed the ratios of potential prey in the environment, like maybe there's another thing that had a different, let's say there was a crab that had a different value. Um, man, my crabs are getting worse. All right, so there's a crab. Um, the crab had a different value and there was a really tiny small fish that had a different value and so like at first you didn't know if this fish here ate the crab or ate this or ate this um, but you can work backwards negative one and negative three to see oh actually this fish was eating the amphipods that's what it was eating um, and so this sort of allows you to sort of plot the isotope values of all of the things in your food web and match them up to see what eats what. So they've done this kind of uh, matching up of isotopes with what things might have eaten with fossils as well because some fossil materials like fossil teeth uh, will actually preserve um, isotope ratios pretty well. And so there's this ancient relative of the manatee. It's kind of an offshoot from the same evolutionary tree of herbivorous plant-eating mammals uh, that the manatee is a member of. So it's, it's really kind of like a distant relative of the manatee. Uh, but it's this very strange looking organism called the Desmo, uh, called the Desmostylian. And uh, these things lived off of the California coast like um, 30 million years ago or so in the, in the Miocene period. And they were really weird. It was sort of like a looked like a cross between a frog and a hippopotamus. This this big, blubbery mammal that was able to walk on land, we think, but also had webbed feet for swimming in the water. And we were pretty sure that they were plant eaters, but we didn't know exactly what they ate. And so they looked at the uh, isotope ratios of carbon and oxygen, and I think some other isotopes as well, in its teeth, and they um, compared them to modern day isotope ratios in potential food sources like sea grasses and kelps and terrestrial vegetation and they found out that the isotope ratios were most consistent with this thing having eaten sea grasses so uh, sea grasses were important even millions of years ago for this uh, strange organism all right so um, this idea of matching up the diet of an organism with its food source gets a little bit complicated if uh, for organisms that could have had multiple food sources. Like uh, a little killifish might not just eat amphipods, it might also eat some other prey as well. And if you try to figure out, well, what did it eat? And then you figure out that, you know, working backwards, you get a point that's right here. You're like, what's going on there? Because there's no organism that I analyzed that has this isotope ratio. Uh, but it turns out that it's actually f um, from a blend of um, some material from the amphipods and some material from the snails that this thing was eating and so you need to use some uh, geometry based math to figure out uh, exactly what blend of different foods the thing ate fortunately uh, we have software uh, including the iso source software from the epa which you can download if you ever need to do this iso source it's a uh, free software that the united states environmental protection agency makes that will help you figure out if you punch in the isotope values for all your different potential prey it'll tell you what your what prey and in what percentages your predator ate so it's, it's really a cool thing um, so i have done some of these kind of uh, isotope studies myself to try to analyze seagrass food webs and um, this is just showing you an example of what uh, an isotope biplot looks like when you put a lot of different plants and animals on it. So these, this is from a survey of the seagrass community in a seagrass bed near Cape Canaveral, Florida.
And so I tried to analyze some things that might be basal food sources in this web, like um, these seagrasses here, uh, three different species of seagrass that were found there. And I tried to look at some algae as well, because um, I wasn't sure if some things might be eating algae or might be eating seagrasses. And I also looked at the sediment itself, because the detritus and bacteria in the sediment could potentially be a source of uh, food for some of the organisms in this system. Uh, and then I looked at animals in the system too. I looked at these organisms that are called mesograzers, uh, different species of amphipods and isopods. And I looked at some snails, or sorry, uh, and I looked at some small predators in the system as well, these uh, small, small fishes. And what I saw was, um, let me see if I can get my trusty pen working here, is that it looks like sediments are the main food source, or meaning like detritus and microorganisms in the sediments are the main food source for the um, little crustaceans, and then the little crustaceans are the main food source for the uh, small fishes that uh, were in this system. So it was sort of like uh, detritus and microorganisms were feeding the little shrimpy guys, and then the little shrimpy guys were feeding the little fishes. And that was kind of how the ecosystem worked. But there were some ambiguities and, and unanswered questions that we had from this study as well, because it didn't seem like anything was really eating much of the seagrass itself. And some of the um, algae had really strange isotope ratios. And like it almost looked like the algae was a predator. What we think is actually happening is that these algae were using a weird source of nitrogen from sewage and that's why the algae have this crazy I nitrogen isotope ratio. So interpreting the results that you get from these isotope studies is not always easy but it's always interesting. All right so in terms of interesting stable isotope studies there's another one that I would like to discuss in this lecture and that's the Lehman et al 2007 study. So uh, Lehman um, was a scientist at, at Florida International University at the time he did the study, and he was working in the Bahamas on this species, Lutjanus griseus, the gray snapper, also known as the mangrove snapper. It's a common Caribbean species that's found not only on reefs, but also in some uh, estuaries and, and lagoons. So the gray snapper is a predator that will eat a relatively wide variety of prey, and uh, in an environment where it has a wide variety of prey, it may, individual snappers may kind of specialize on just one thing or another thing. So there tends to be some variation in isotope ratios among individual snappers, just as there would be among humans. Like, you know, if, if one person eats a lot of seafood and the other person eats a lot of, I don't know, uh, pasta, th they would have different uh, stable isotope ratios. And it turns out that animals in nature are kind of similar. They have favorite foods too, even within the same species. Uh, so that's a little background on this study. Um, the other thing that is that this study was looking at niche width. Niche width is sort of like uh, the range of conditions or lifestyles that an organism can have. So if an organism is able to eat a lot of different foods that would be sort of like a broad dietary niche so um, dietary niche width um, whereas if the organism had like a really small range of foods it would be like a, a narrow narrow diet and so this is uh, something that layman was interested in looking at for the gray snapper um, and in this Bahamian Tidal Creek ecosystem where Lehman was looking, there are problems of habitat fragmentation. So there's construction and development on these islands, and these tidal creeks that connect uh, seagrass flats with sort of uh, backwater areas where there's sort of lagoons and, and mangrove swamps, the, it's really easy for these tidal creeks to be interrupted if somebody you know, builds a road across the mouth of the creek and that can sort of cut off some of the connectivity of the ecosystems and it means that fish that are in here 
no longer have access to some of the food resources they might have gotten uh, if they'd been able to uh, roam around more widely through the habitat. So potentially uh, breaking up the habitat into these smaller chunks is limiting the potential food resources of these snappers. So this idea of habitat fragmentation negatively impacting organisms is a big thing in both terrestrial ecology and marine ecology because as humans spread across the landscape, we are fragmenting natural habitats in lots of ways as you can see in this picture of Central Park in New York City. Uh, it looks like a forest, a little, there's a little golf course or baseball fields or something there. It's not, it's not entirely forest, um, but this forest is definitely not the same as if it wasn't surrounded by the city. Uh, so uh, habitat fragments tend not to work quite the same way as the original habitat uh, worked. Um, some of the things that can fragment the habitat are dams and reservoirs. Reservoirs are lakes created behind dams. Roads and fences can break up habitats, logging and clearing. So it's like if it used to be a bunch of forest and now the different chunks of forest are isolated from each other. Trawling, which is dragging big nets across the seafloor that can um, break up uh, seabed habitats. Dredging and filling can break up habitats. And climate and sea level change can break up habitats as um, places that were continuous habitats get isolated. And then the just the sprawling development on the land, farms, towns, and suburbs can break up habitats. So um, as I said, the leftover habitat is not always the same as the original habitat. So one of the differences is that there's just a decrease in the total habitat area. So before fragmentation, you've got lots of area of habitat. After fragmentation, it's just there's not as much there. Um, and the patch size is smaller. So here you've got one big patch. Now you've got three smaller patches that are, none of these are as big as the original patch after fragmentation has happened. Um, and there is an increasing edge to interior ratio. So if you're an organism that likes edges, maybe this is not a big deal. But if you're an organism that needs to hide in the middle of a patch, then um, you won't have as much place to hide uh, when after the habitat fragmentation has happened. Uh, another thing that can happen is that there are the, you're introducing barriers to dispersal, so populations become isolated. So, like now, the thing in this habitat patch can't get to can't get from one habitat patch to the next habitat patch. Um, this is a big problem for things like anadromous fish. These are Atlantic salmon. Uh, I think the genus is Salmo salar. So these uh, Atlantic salmon uh, spawn in streams, and then their adult phase is in the ocean. But when there's dams on the streams, they can't um, get to their habitats, and the populations can become isolated or, or even landlocked. Uh, if they can't get to the ocean, then they have to live their whole life in the freshwater system. Uh, and then fragmentation changes the physical environment and the resource supply. So one of the changes in the physical environment that's often cited for when forest habitats are fragmented is that the forests now are exposed to like more wind and more drying out and more sunlight gets in because um, there's more edge where those, those things happen. So like the, the physical environment can actually change uh, from a large contiguous habitat to a broken up habitat. Uh, it's something that we notice in seagrass beds because if you have a big seagrass bed, the seagrass tends to kind of like reduce the water flow and, and clarify the water within itself. Whereas if you have just a small chunk of seagrass bed, it's not really insulating itself from the surrounding environment. All right, and so we think that habitat fragmentation can have effects on food webs as well, and that it's a big cause of extinctions and biodiversity loss. So we think that habitat fragmentation restructures food webs because in a smaller habitat, there won't be as many species, and there will be fewer um, connections in the food web. So in a fragmented habitat, uh, for some of the predators have been eliminated from this uh, habitat during the course of fragmentation. And for the predator that's left, 
it doesn't have all the same food sources available as it did in the unfragmented habitat. So there's a big restructuring of food webs. And uh, Lehman's idea was that the uh, breadth of diet of the predators might decrease from this like wide breadth of diet in the unfragmented habitat to sort of like a narrower breadth of diet in the fragmented habitat. So uh, the idea that Lehman had was to use stable isotope biplots to estimate the diet breadth of the gray snapper. And so what, they, what he did was he got a bunch of gray snapper and he looked at the stable isotope ratios of each individual. And because th each individual would kind of become a specialist in its own favorite foods, you would have these different values at different points on the stable isotope biplot, sort of representing you know, the typical values, but also kind of like the extremes of the diet specialist individuals. Uh, and then you could sort of trace this shape to estimate sort of like the total um, zone or, or breadth of uh, diet for this, this species. And so that's just a tracing, tracing of the shape there. All right. So uh, when Lehman did this study, he saw in, when he compared the diet breadth of a bunch of snappers from uh, an unfragmented habitat and got this sort of broad range here, he saw that that was a much broader range than the diet breadth from the fragmented habitats. Uh, and that sort of, uh, he concluded that the fr habitat fragmentation was greatly decreasing the niche width of the snappers. So there are some potential caveats to this interpretation, though, because you could have a relatively narrow um, zone of stable isotope values if the fishes were eating um, a narrow range of food sources or if they were eating a similar mix of a broad range of food sources. So there's more than one way that you could get narrow diet breadth in a diagram and you would need to have pretty good data on the gut contents as well to make sure that their diet breadth was narrow because they were eating fewer things and not just because they were eating a more even mix of things.